This is a reenactment of a talk that I gave last week uh, because someone was unable to be there. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about Koopman classical mechanics, and particularly about field theory and signal analysis. I'm going to begin by discussing algebraic quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, and how that applies to uh, classical mechanics in particular, and how that relates to Koopman's Hilbert space formalism for classical mechanics. So because I'm going to introduce uh, uh, operator non-commutativity, that introduces the possibility, and indeed what there is measurement incompatibility in that classical mechanics. And so that gives us a measurement problem for classical mechanics. And that, I found, informs how we can think about the measurement problem for quantum mechanics. So now I'm going to think about quantum field theory and about what I'm going to call quantum non-demolition field theory, which is no terminology that comes from quantum computing that just means that QNDFT is a commutative, very classical-seeming, algebraic approach to effectively classical random field theory. Or we can think of it as an algebraic approach to stochastic processes in 1 plus 3 dimensions, or indeed noisy signal analysis in, again, 1 plus 3 dimensions. So then I'm going to apply signal analysis thinking to how we think about renormalization. And then I won't have time for quantum gravity, but there are three slides if anyone wants to look at them. So Koopman in 1931 suggested that indeed we could construct a Hilbert space formalism for classical Hamiltonian mechanics. And that was used almost immediately by Birkhoff and von Neumann to prove two different versions of the ergodic theorem. Then it almost drops off the map. One hardly sees any literature until Sudarshan in 1976 points out that this is indeed a useful formalism for discussing chaotic dynamics. And that has become uh, quite a vibrant literature um, called Koopman Met Methods since then. But even earlier than 1931, Carl Eckhart had suggested that we could use an algebraic operator calculus as a formalism for discussion of classical mechanics in particular, and that in physical review. So that gives us three ways to compare quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. There's Wigner functions, the Moyle product, uh, and on phase space, in other words, it's a shared formalism, or Koopman and ordinary quantum mechanics with the shared Hilbert space formalism, or we can discuss everything in a shared algebraic formalism. So for quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, there are abstract measurements, m1, m2, m3, we can add them, we can multiply them, where each linear operator corresponds to a random variable, and the spectrum of a linear operator corresponds to a sample space of a random variable. So then, if the algebra is non-commutative, we say it's quantum mechanics. If it's commutative, we say it's classical mechanics. And then we uh, adopt a number of other algebraic properties so that we can make contact with quantum mechanics eventually, because at the moment we're doing something which doesn't look much like quantum mechanics. But then, that, those are abstract measurements. They, in order to make contact with uh, experiment, we need to have something that tells us what measurement results to expect for those measurements in a particular physical uh, context. And that we call a state, indeed a statistical state, where rho of m1 tells us the expected measurement result for the measurement m1 in the state rho. And that also includes the moments of that same measurement can be constructed like this. And because those moments all exist and, and uh, predict values for moments, uh, we also um, can construct a generating operator and a generating function for those. And here I'm going to use the engineer's imaginary, J, because I want to keep one foot in uh, mathematics and one foot uh, grounded in engineering and signal analysis. And then because this is the Fourier transform of a probability distribution, we can take the inverse Fourier transform to obtain a probability distribution, and we can write it like this. So now a state, in order to make contact with quantum mechanics, has to satisfy four conditions. One, because po probabilities are positive, we have this form of positivity. Normalization requires this. And then we have von Neumann linearity, so that even if A and B are operators that do not commute, we nonetheless have this linear condition satisfied. And then we also require compatibility with the adjoint, so this commutative diagram is satisfied. Now, once we have these measurement operators, we can use them to modulate the state to give us different 
expected measurement results. So now we're talking in signal analysis kind of uh, language, modulation, because this construction satisfies the same uh, conditions that have to be satisfied by a state. And that is the basis of the GNS construction, which gives us a Hilbert space, and now we are much more in the sort of uh, mathematics that we expect for quantum mechanics. And indeed, the GNS construction lets us think of a state applied to a measurement operator M as a vector and a covector bracketed around a measurement operator, and similarly for a modulated state. So I'm going to take a first look at quantum field theory, just one slide, and then we'll do some, some more elementary quantum mechanics. Uh, and we're going to nudge ourselves towards signal analysis. If you look at quantum field textbooks for a scalar field, you find this expression early on in the book, where phi of x is an operator value distribution. It's not a measurement operator. But we can construct an, an f measurement, as I'm going to call it, by doing what's called smearing the test, the operator value distribution with what's called in mathematics a test function. And indeed, because it's used to smear, as we say, it's also called a smearing function. But in signal analysis, a very similar idea is called a window function because it tells us how we're looking at the world. Now, because of the way we constructed it, the adjoint of an F measurement is an F star measurement, where F star is just the complex conjugate for the function space. And we can write this as two components. An F measurement is the sum of an F star, and a lowering operator, and an F raising operator. What F of X tells us is where and how big and what shape the measurement is. Now for a vacuum state, because this is a positive operator, this must be a positive number. And indeed, that is in this construction is the, uh, the same thing for F and replacing this by G. And this has to be a pre-inner quadrat. And for the, for the uh, Klein-Gordon uh, uh, field in particular, we project to the forward mass shell, and then we take the product of the wave number components for the two functions. And then we can write the raising and lowering operators, the commutator of those, uh, just in terms of that pre-inner product. And of course, the lowering operator annihilates the vacuum. So then, as on the previous slide, we can construct a generating function for measurements of, uh, for an F measurement. And that gives us this Gaussian expression, because it is a Gaussian state. Uh, and indeed, if F is real valued, then we can construct this probability distribution, which is a normal probability distribution. And the variance is given by the two-point vacuum expectation value uh, smeared by the test function F twice over. So then we can also discuss modulated states and give us, and we can construct a non-Gaussian probability distributions that way. And that allows us, too, to construct a usefully smaller Hilbert space than the full Fox space, because we can ge generate a Hilbert space just using the F measurements freely and freely generating an algebra. So now to step back out of that, uh, that really was just an introduction, we can also think about, uh, two slides ago, in terms of an elementary matrix model. Because if we have a measurement M that has a sample space uh, of many numbers, then we can use an operator M hat that in some basis can be presented as a diagonal matrix. And then for the nth moment of, that, of measurements of that in the state row, we have this expression, which we can write as the trace. And that, in turn, it can be written as the trace of the product of the two matrices in that basis. And that gives us the number we expect. But if we do a different measurement, M prime, that has the matrix diagonal in a different context of the same state, so a different basis, then we construct the nth moment of that measurement exactly the same way, and we obtain a different probability distribution, a different set of numbers for the pi primes, because we're t using the different diagonal of the same matrix, the same operator. So this gives us a way of encoding in a single formal structure multiple probability spaces. There's no physics in this. There's just a, ma a matrix model of a generalized probability theory, as it's called in the, in the literature. And indeed, there was groundwork for this was put down even by George Ball in, 19, in 1854. This is something that uh, predates quantum mechanics by quite a long way. Uh, that's a little bit of a stretch. 
But nonetheless, George Ball really does uh, anticipate some of this in some ways. So for traditional classical physics, we just use different initial conditions for different contexts. They, we keep them completely separate. But operator algebra gives us more tools for modeling different contexts, and this is something that a classical physicist could reasonably think they want to use. So how does this apply to classical mechanics in particular? If we take classical mechanics to be an algebra of functions on phase space, which is commonly done, then we notice that it has three binary operations, not two, not just addition and multiplication. There's also the Poisson bracket. This is not a straightforward high school algebra. But we can make things rather more familiar by introducing two classes of operators, multiply by W and Poisson by W, which uses the Poisson bracket in a similar sort of way. And indeed, there's a familiar example, which is Poisson by the Hamiltonian function, which gives us a generator of time evolution, and that's called, in classical mechanics, the Louvillian operator. So now we have constructed for ourselves a non-commutative algebra with addition and composition, only two binary operations now. So this is more familiar. This is kind of the sort of thing that one even sees in high school uh, classes. So I suggest we can use the Zys and the Zs of something that's more powerful than classical mechanics, because it now includes this non-commutative structure so long as we're willing to use such things as the Poisson by W raised to the power of N. And that is enough to give us an algebraic measurement theory that's shared with quantum mechanics. There's non-commutativity, Benjamin incompatibility, and all of the, the algebraic structure one expects from, quant from uh, quantum mechanics. And the payback for this, payoff for this, is that we can have isomorphisms instead of quantization and the correspondence principle, which kind of are reverses of each other, but it's really not an isomorphism. It's a bit of a mess in some ways. Now that was for a, uh, a general case of a classical mechanics. To present a state for that would be prohibitive, and so I'm going to specialize to the classical simple harmonic oscillator, for which we have the Poisson bracket as just this uh, anti-symmetric form. Uh, and of course, we have for multiplication, just multiplication by Q and by P, we have Poisson by P is just derivative respect to Q. And that results in these two uh, commutators, which are very reminiscent of the Heisenberg algebra, but without a complex structure. So then we have, for uh, the multiplication by the Hamiltonian function, it's just multiplication by this, Poisson by the Hamiltonian function is this differential operator. So now, if we, if we want to state for this, classical simple harmonic oscillator, the natural place to go in the 19th century is the Gibbs thermal state at temperature kT. And I'm going to present it in a generating function form, and I'm again going to use the engineer's imaginary, J. And so we can present the Gibbs state just as this Gaussian expression, because indeed it should be Gaussian for a simple harmonic oscillator, as we're well used to. But now we have because we've introduced the engineer's imaginary, we now do, in fact, have the Heisenberg algebra. And so there's only a very limited range of, uh, well, everything is isomorphic to everything that is uh, also a, um, a representation of the, the Heisenberg algebra. And so the natural thing to do is to introduce raising and lowering operators, but using kT instead of using h bar. And then we obtain, for example, for, for just these two operators, the Poisson by P and Poisson by Q, which commute with each other, we obtain just a Gaussian expression, just to, as we do for the Y and Q, and Y and Q and Y P. And then we can construct modulated, non-equilibrium states grounded on the uh, thermal state, and hence that we can obtain a, a thermal Hilbert space entirely uh, within classical physics. So instead of trying to map classical Q and P to quantum Q and P, which doesn't work. We can instead map CM plus to quantum mechanics, Q and J partial to Q. This is now an isomorphism to quantum Q1 and P1, and we have similar sort of construction for the P and J partial to P. But crucially here, KT is not H bar. So people sometimes slip in H bar and say, look, it's quantum mechanics, but I suggest, and I'm going to show you in the next slide why I think so, that that's, uh, that's too fast. But the Gibbs state is also about an irreducible noise. We only know the effects of the simple harmonic oscillator's interactions with heat bath. So long as the uh, physical system we're trying to model does actually satisfy this uh, probability distribution, that's good enough. We don't need to know. We don't want to know. We can't find out what the heat bath 
dynamics is. So what is the difference between quantum and thermal noise? H-bar has units of action, whereas KT has units of energy, so there's a difference of units. But for detail, the place to go, I suggest, is quantum field theory, where one finds that the quantum vacuum is Poincaré invariant, whereas thermal noise is not. And so quantum noise, which is what the quantum vacuum is about, is Poincaré invariant. And this is a difference of symmetry properties. It's something fundamental, but it's something that can be used in CM plus quite easily. And so adopting that for CM plus, we have that h-bar is an amplitude of a Poincaré invariant noise, and kt is an amplitude of a thermal noise, which is different, because it has different symmetry properties. But this gives us a new reason to think we must work with field theories. The Lorentz group can only be defined in at least 1 plus 1 dimensions, and so everything from now on will be field theoretic. And as well, we have that h-bar approaching zero is no longer, in this approach, CM plus approach, a classical approximation. It is instead a mean field approximation where if the, uh, the effects of the, thermal, uh, of the quantum noise can be approximated just by a mean field approximation, then that uh, is appropriate. But otherwise, it's not a classical approximation. So there's a crucial difference between uh, quantum, CM plus and quantum mechanics that I'm going to preserve. And that is that if we look at the Gibbs state of the simple harmonic oscillator, uh, JZH, which is the Hermitian generator of evolution, is this operator, and that is not a positive, definite, positive semi-definite oper operator. Whereas the, in stark contrast, the Hamiltonian operator is bounded below. And that results in analytic properties for quantum mechanics that no mathematician is going to want to give up, and I don't suggest we should. So instead, I'm going to suggest that CM plus does include non-commutativity, does include quantum noise, which is enough to ensure the measurement theory is the same. But we don't adopt analyticity into CM plus. It makes quantum mechanics and CM plus different. It means we can compare quantum mechanics and CM plus. It means that we can consider, in particular, the measurement problem. So let me finally, for classical mechanics, before we move on, say to you how classical mechanics has been straw-manned. For a classical a simple harmonic oscillator, we're allowed to use this deriv derivative to generate translations. And so if we uh, bracket the, uh, the multiplication by Q by this unitary operation, then we just, that just has the effect of subtracting a constant from the multiplication. But we're not allowed to use ZP cubed, which also generates a unitary uh, transformation, because when we do that, we obtain this operator. And this operator now is a multiplication by Q, but also a second order derivative with respect to Q. And that gives us something that looks very different in a way. And yet, from a quantum mechanical point of view, this is not different at all. This is just a unitary transformation applied to the multiplication, and so it is physically equivalent. And we can adopt that way of thinking into classical mechanics perfectly well. Because quantum mechanics happily uses that uh, operator as an anti-emission generator, uh, and so we can do just the same for classical mechanics. Contextuality and measurement incompatibility are classically understandable. They're an effective way to encode multiple additional conditions. And we can just think of it in those terms. So now, stepping out of that mathematics, and just considering for a moment a much more um, experimental and signal, in a signal analysis kind of way, I'm going to suggest we think about Gregor Wiese's experiment from the mid-1990s in terms of field theory and signal analysis, not in terms of particles. Now, one reason I like Gregor's experiment is because this uh, schematic, which is taken from page 60 of his thesis, is very clear about two things that really make a big difference to me. First of all, he talks about the experiment, about the experiment apparatus at the center pumping, pumping the apparatus. And I'm going to say he's pumping the noisy electromagnetic field within the apparatus. He does not talk about shoveling particles into the apparatus, which everybody else does. The second thing I like about his, about his experiment, uh, his schematic, is that he um, is extremely clear that there are four signals 
into the, appara into the apparatus that stores data to the computer, to computer memory. Uh, there are two signals that tell us the time and that tell us what random bit value is being put into the modulator any, at any given time. And then there are two other signals from avalanche photodiodes. And if we think about what those signals look like, it would be something like this, perhaps, where it's very noisy, but nonetheless, there is a clear time at which the signal suddenly becomes much higher, and we record the time of an event when the signal does that. So we've compressed this, this, this signal enormously by only recording the time at which events happen. So when we uh, get experimental results, which Gregor did, then Alice sees in this 10 second time period almost 400,000 events. And in that time, Bob also sees a comparable number of events, uh, but 15,000 of those happen within three nanoseconds of Alice events. And so every single one of these events here corresponds to a time at which two of the signal lines suddenly go to a higher level. And within the, uh, the color scheme I've used here, the majority are green or yellow, where red corresponds to the bit values for the avalanche photodiode number and the electro-optic modulator setting are, are the same, and the blue is the low diagonal and the yellow and green are the, are the two diagonals. So now if we take that graphic and turn it on its side, and we take a hundred different vertical slices, uh, then we can construct these 16 histograms, where we can clearly see that the blues and reds are much dominated by the yellows and greens. And we can add up the number of such, such events, and we can uh, put those numbers into a by now completely uh, routine calculation of a number, which is a violation of a CHSH inequality, a Bell inequality. So all we've done is we've taken a completely classical set of data, We've applied a completely classical algorithm, and we've obtained a number for which classical mechanics says this is not OK. Now, in quantum mechanics, we use non-commuting operators to model bell violating statistics. This is something one finds in the literature after about 1980, when people started to analyze the things in a slightly different way than they had prior to that. And you find a paper by Arthur Fine in uh, 1982 uh, in Physical Review Letters, and another by Landau, which is very, very concise mathematically, uh, just one page almost, uh, which uh, in physical, physical Letters A. But in classical mechanics, as usual, usual, we don't have non-commuting operators available. We can say that classical mechanics is computationally incomplete. So instead of saying that quantum mechanics is incomplete, we can now say class classical mechanics is computationally incomplete. But we've added non-commutativity into CM plus. So CM, of CM plus, that cannot be said. CM plus is, because it's held with space formalism, formalism, is equally capable as quantum mechanics is. Now, I could talk about non-locality for an extended period, but I won't uh, if anyone wanted to talk about quantum mechanics. Uh, question in Q&A, then I would have done so. So, as I say, we've now introduced a measurement problem for classical mechanics, and I found that this allowed me to rethink what we're doing when we see measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And this is in an article in JFIS A in 2022. So suppose we have two measurements A and B that have different sample spaces, and we present them in terms of projection operators. Then if we do one of those measurements on its own for a state vector psi, then we obtain the result alpha m with probability given by bracketing the vector and its covector around the projection operators. But if we do two measurements of a first followed by b, we say that the result alpha m collapses the state vector. And so the state vector psi becomes a different psi state vector, which we construct by using the project, same projection operators and then normalizing appropriately. So then, if we measure B in that state, because it's following uh, A, then we obtain the result alpha and followed by beta n, and that's a conditional probability, and we construct that this way, and that's just this expression. And so we find that the joint probability is just this rather simpler expression in many ways. So now we have these positive operators that generate 
joint probabilities for the result alpha m beta m. So instead of collapse affecting a state, we can take collapse to affect the next measurement. We have this operator becomes this uh, sequence operator for the two measurements, one after the other. And then we can use those positive operators to construct a collapse product, as I call it, a positive operator valued measure A collapse B that has the sample space alpha and beta n. And we can do that even if the two measurement operators do not commute. But now, the existence of the joint probability is traditionally classical. So we can instead use commuting operators, A prime and B prime, in a different vector state, in a different Hilbert space, that give us the same joint probability because there's plenty of enough flexibility. Uh, we can have, use an arbitrarily large Hilbert space, if we like, to reproduce the results we had from the first model we had, the first quantum mechanical model. This is now a new quantum mechanical model that, where PM prime and QM prime both commute with each other. Mathematically, this is to use the Neimark dilation theorem that allows us to construct a joint projection-valued measurement, AB, that's the same as A collapse B. And it's in a larger Hilbert space. And this is an alternative way to think about uh, the collapse of wave function instead of using decoherence. Now, again, because of time, I didn't discuss this slide, and I won't discuss it in this reenactment either. But you can look at it. So then we have... Um, what we've done, we can think of as having constructed what I'm calling a super Heisenberg picture. Because we have, for the Schrodinger picture, we apply unitary evolution and collapse to the state. For the Heisenberg picture, we apply unitary evolution to measurements instead. But for the super Heisenberg picture, we can think of it as applying unitary evolution and collapse to measurements. So it's one step beyond Heisenberg. And indeed, I, I, again, I chose not to talk about this because of time, uh, but there are many different names one could give this, because this really I find to be a very unifying way, approach to collapse. It allows us to really think about multiple uh, interpretations in, very, in a very unified kind of way. But think about it. So where there particularly is something of a problem with collapse is that there are ambiguities when there many collapses are needed. Because, in fact, in general, uh, we have that A collapse B followed by collapse C is just not the same as the different ordering of brackets. So the idea of collapse is non-associative. And that's because measurements must be somehow grouped together as this follows by this or in a different order. And when we talk about signal analysis, when we have many measurements, all at time-like separation, so that conventionally in ordinary quantum mechanics we would say that they all do not commute, then there'd be many collapses, and we have to decide what all of those collapses are going to be applied in. Uh, and nonetheless, what we come out with at the end is a joint probability. Whatever construction we use has to come out with a joint probability. But there is an alternative, which is we can do what signal analysis does, which is to use lots and lots of commuting operators with a different starting state, and that all set up so that we get the same joint probability out of this different kind of model, all of which is still within quantum mechanics. So we can think of collapse as a dynamical process if we want. But we can also just take it to be a joint probability algorithm, something that allows us to construct joint probabilities. This is not something that's new to me. This is something that is, is in the literature only sporadically. You'll have to go looking for it. Nonetheless, it's out there. And there's a necessary trade-off here. And that is that quantum mechanics is good for incompatible measurements, CM plus is good for joint measurements, and both of them have a little bit of a trouble with, with the other possibility. Nonetheless, both of them can do what's necessary. So now to apply all this to quantum fields, and to quantum non-demolition fields too. Just to recap, for quantum mechanics we have measurements M1, M2, M3, and so on, Mn. And that's not enough, of course. We need something more than just, here is a set of n measurements. We need something that tells us what each of those measurements is when we did an experiment, so that we can reproduce the experiment if we want to do so. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to anticipate quantum field theory. I'm going to say, instead of having m1 through mn and description 1 through description n as two separate, constructors, two separate structures, we can merge them together by taking the index set for the measurements to be the description space itself. 
Of a quantum field theory, we do, we do that in a fairly formal way, just taking uh, an F measurement to be a test function on, uh, the Hilbert, on the Minkowski space, or indeed a, uh, a window function. And then we have multiple measurements, MF1 and so on and so forth, where those test functions are descriptions of how a measurement is different from point-like. tells us how we're smearing, how, how the window works. Now, this dual formalism, I think, is fundamental here. If we work with the test functions, instead of working with the operator value distributions, we can really construct a much more effective mathematics because we can easily multiply the test functions together without worrying about whether multiplication is well-defined, which it typically is not for operator value distributions. So for quantum field theory, we have that F measurements commute with G measurements if the supports of those test functions are space-like separated. Whereas for quantum non-demolition field theory, the only change is that F, measure, F, Q, and D measurements always commute with a G, Q, and D measurement. And for quantum optics, in a few slides' time, I'm going to show you how it is isomorphic to Q and D optics in several different ways. But first, just to focus on a sort of signal analysis kind of way of thinking about this, but really to focus on the difference between this and ordinary signal analysis, should we say. We can think of the vacuum state as a noisy carrier signal because there are many frequencies and the phase relationships for those many frequencies is not defined except that it's random. And so that gives us something that we can modulate in a probabilistic way. So for example, for the free field, we have the normal distribution, as we saw on the first slide, where we have this operator, the F measurement generating operator gives us a Gaussian uh, characteristic function. We can take the inverse Fourier transform of that to obtain a normal distribution with the variance F, F, which is determined by the two-point vacuum expectation value smeared by F and F. But then we can modulate that by bracketing the F measurement generating operator with a unitary and its adjoint. And that gives us a simple displacement of the probability distribution from one place to another, where the extent of the, how much the displacement is, is determined by the overlap between F and G, as it's commonly called. But we can also modulate the probability distribution itself by using a G measurement and its adjoint, and then normalizing, bracketed around the F measurement generating operator. And that gives us this probability distribution. And by using an arbitrary polynomial in the G measurement, we can arrange for almost any probability distribution you might like. And you can arrange for the probability distribution to vary over space and time, depending on the overlap of various different functions. Now, because this is a modulation of probabilities, so that Gregor Wiese, for example, modulated the probabilities at the four different avalanche photodiodes completely independently, we can also modulate joint measurements. And I'm going to call this a Wigner characteristic function because this, is, when you take the inverse Fourier transform of this, we only obtain a probability distribution if all of the F measurements commute with each other. So we can think of F, an F measurement as something like a current measurement on a specific signal line as we saw out of Gregor's experiment, uh, and then when uh, we see a sudden change of that signal level, then we say, look, there's a particle, we record the time. Now, that's all local measurements. If we want to analyze global properties of a model, then we'll need to introduce global tools, things like number operators and the vacuum, the vacuum projection operator, uh, but those are all not observables. An F measurement really is this voltage the voltage or the current on this signal line now. So I didn't talk about this either, uh, again because of time. Uh, but now, for the Gaussian state, the reason I wanted to introduce uh, the uh, Wigner characteristic function is because for a Gaussian state, we can actually uh, compute the value of the, the Wigner characteristic function by using Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff identities to separate out this factor which is, uh, and it represents the non-commutativity, and this factor, which is simply the Gaussian noise uh, factor. And that gives us this Gaussian noise term and this non-commutativity term, and that fixes the algebraic structure completely with just that one equation. And indeed, I want to point out that 
for this construction to be a state, to satisfy the axiomatic the uh, requirements for it to be state, all we need is for this matrix FIFJ to be positive semi-definite. And that means uh, that uh, it can be non-linear in the test functions. It does not have to be linear. So that fixed the algebraic structure. We can also, we also must fix the geometric and dynamical structure. And we can do that in multiple ways. We already saw the Klein-Gordon uh, expression. But for quantum optics, we have something quite similar, and yet, of course, different. We project to the forward, like cone. And then because we're now using bivector-valued uh, test functions, we construct two space-like four vectors, both of which are orthogonal to the wave number. And consequently, this is negative definite, or negative semi-definite, rather. And so this whole expression is a pre inner product just as we had for the Klein-Gordon state, the Klein-Gordon uh, dynamics. And both those constructions are manifestly Poincaré invariant. But now, if we want an everywhere commutative Gaussian quantum non-diminishing field, all we have to do is remove the theta k0. If we do that, the non-commutativity term vanishes because the symmetries of this, of this uh, new system are different. And you'll see that we have a Poincaré invariant h-bar scale noise. This is not kt. This is something completely different. This is not a Gibbs thermal state. Now, you might complain, and indeed you should, I think, uh, that, well, negative frequencies are not OK because those would be associated with instability or with backward causality. But in signal analysis, that's not the case. Because what negative frequencies do for us for signal analysis is for example, for the real signal, we just use the cosine of omega t, which has both positive and negative frequencies to give us a real value. But for the analytic signal, as it's called in signal analysis, we have just we just use the exponential of j omega t, and that has nice mathematical properties, which we use very frequently when we use, do signal analysis. So now let me describe to you precisely the relationship between quantum and QND optics. I'm going to use the raising and lowering operators that I introduced earlier on in the first look. And we have the commutator for the uh, F measurement and G measurement is the same as we had on the previous slide. Now, for quantum optics in particular, we can find an involution that, sat that satisfies this particular relationship here. And that is enough to allow us to construct an FQ and D measurement using the bullet involution and the, uh, and the complex conjugate in a different order than you have for the F bullet measurement. And this, for this construction, we find that the F Q and D and G Q and D measurements always commute. And so that generates a Q and D optics field. It's a commutative algebra. And the Hilbert space is isomorphic because we've used the same raising operators acting on the same vacuum vector. But that algebra generated by the F Q and D measurements is clearly not isomorphic to that generated by the F measurements because, of course, this is not the same as this. But because this is effectively a classical system, we'd expect to be able to introduce a Poisson bracket, or indeed we ought to be able to, we ought to introduce a Poisson bracket. But if that's too difficult, or just too long-winded, then we can also just use the raising and lowering operators, or just use the vacuum projection operator, as we routinely do in quantum optics in any case. And if we do that, we obtain a non-commutative algebra just as we do for quantum optics. And indeed, then those algebras generated with those additional non-commutative structures are exactly the same and do allow us to model with QND optics anything we can model with quantum optics. Now, to be explicit about a particular choice of the bullet involution, uh, and there are, it's not unique, uh, we can project two left and right helices where the star is the Hodge dual, and then we change the sign here. And that construction is Lorentz invariant. It's not translation invariant or local, but that doesn't matter from the point of view of either, oh, excuse me, from, e from the point of view of either quantum optics or quantum non diminution optics considered in, in isolation. Both of those are Poincaré invariant. Now, this is by no means a panacea. This, this actually is uh, something that is quite complicated, and I'm not talking about it, obviously, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's uh, not as 
uh, it's somewhat like de Broglie Bohm because it gives us a classical kind of system that is effectively a maximal consistent histories interpretation of quantum optics. But this is linear, different from de Broglie Bohm, and it's Lorentz invariant, again different from de Broglie Bohm. And so I find it more uh, more interesting from that from those two aspects. So to move on to renormalization, where I'm going to take as a starting point the Whiteman axioms. The remarkable thing about the Whiteman axioms is they're incredibly simple. We have a Hilbert space H, uh, there's a Poincaré invariant vacuum vector, then there's an uh, operator value distribution that uh, gives us uh, measurement operators, and then there's microcausality, commutativity at space light separation, and there are these three other um, uh, axioms, which I'm going to take to be uh, purely formal, uh, not, not relevant for the discussion that follows. Even though they're so simple, there are no well-defined interacting models in 1 plus 3 dimensions, even after 60 plus years, no physics. But if we think about those axioms in terms of quantum non-demolition field theory and in terms of signal analysis, there are at least three ways in which the Whiteman axioms look too strong. First of all, uh, According to quantum non-demolition field theory, we, we would allow negative frequencies in the vacuum state, and we'd allow commutativity at all separations. That would give us a completely different mathematics, but nonetheless equivalent. On the other hand, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is allowing quantum fields to be non-linear maps into the star algebra A. So first to point out, there are two linearities implicit in the Whiteman axioms. We have the von Neumann linearity we started with, uh, and that's required to ensure a probability interpretation, and don't want to mess with that. On the other hand, F measurements are axiomatically linear in the test functions as well. So we have this quite different linearity. But in signal analysis, where F of X and G of X we might think of as window or modulation functions, and this construction F comma G, we might think of as a resonance between a window and a modulation function. Really, we wouldn't expect that to be linear, or not precisely linear. We might hope for it to be linear across some wide range, but nonetheless, we would know it would not be linear everywhere and for all amplitudes. And so it's not so obvious that we should make that axiomatic. We should consider the axioms with the linear case, but we should also consider axioms with the nonlinear case. Then we can use the Whiteman axioms in either linear or nonlinear forms. And if we work with a more general construction, where, for example, the descriptions might even be just a paragraph of text, and then a large language model will construct for us a matrix that just has to be positive semi-definite, and that would allow us to do all of the probability theory that we've seen in the previous slides. Now, I don't take these to be a strong argument, because I think uh, it's not unreasonable to say, well, we want a fundamental field, should be linear. And so I think we should look for other arguments. And in fact, we find another argument in real space renormalization in particular. Uh, when nonlinearity appears, when we consider, for example, a test function that is a smearing function on this square region, and we split that into nine fragments that add up to give us the same smearing function that we started with. Then we perform each of those nine measurements, we get a result back, and we decide whether it's positive or negative, and we add up those positive or plus or minus ones and decide whether the result of that addition is plus or minus one. So now we have a fragmented F measurement, which is clearly nonlinear in the test function. And indeed, we iterate that many times for real space renormalization. So now we have that this fragmented F measurement is nonlinear in the test function, and it's manifestly different from the inaccessible, what we might call the bare F measurement. Nonetheless, the dressed F measurement is arguably still a quantum field. We would use that in an effective field theory sort of way perfectly happily. And I think that's a slightly better argument. But we can also look at uh, the renormalization group. And here I'm going to take from a book by Hollywood in 2013, where he suggests that a measurement f uh, should be taken to be a function of a, an interaction parameters and of a characteristic length scale, which tells us what the measurement is. And then we either take mu or mu prime. And the content of renormalization is that these two ex expressions from two different theories with different cutoffs uh, should be the same independently of whether we choose mu or mu prime. But that's 
L is a ludicrously uh, brief description of an experiment. We should have some much more detail. And the way to write experimental details uh, in quantum field theory is to say what test functions you're going to use. And so we put those in instead of L. And those should be a more or less complete description. Hopefully, in 50 years' time anyway, uh, we'd enter them into design software and they'd tell us what the results would be. But the cutoff scale is also uh, it depends on the same details. And so mu and mu prime should both be different functionals of the test functions. And that fixes an effective dynamics. And hence we can absorb all that functional dependence on f1 through fn into a single new function. And now that functional is definitely more linear than we had at the beginning. So again, we have uh, a more complicated argument, but we've got the same end result. And of course, renormalization just becomes an almost trivial statement that f prime is the same as f. Now, for a fourth argument, uh, this is something I only recently came across. Uh, this is from Laura Reshi, uh, a, talk, uh, a companion article about axiomatic quantum field theory and the Karkowski axioms. One finds what's called strong additivity, which is equivalent to lin linearity, or closely equivalent at least, to linearity. Uh, in the Whiteman axioms. And as she says, and I agree, uh, the strong additivity is a precise way of framing, in algebraic terms, the idea that the whole is not greater than the sum of its parts. And so, by fiat, axiomatically, holism is being completely ruled out as an aspect of the hard counselor or the Whiteman axioms. A huge 50 years of argument about this is just wiped away. Again, we should just use either nonlinear or linear according to the situation. And we should certainly not rule out nonlinearity axiomatically. So what I've argued here is that renormalization is a backdoor way to inject nonlinearity into the axioms of quantum field theory, the hard counsel or the Whiteman axioms. So if we now look at um, what we find in a um, what we find in a textbook description of interacting quantum field theory, you'll find somewhere a generating functional for vacuum expectation values, time-ordered vacuum expectation values. And here, we'll, it's, you'll find fairly early on in the textbook an expression something like this, that is, well that is point invariant, but it's not well-defined. So how exactly one might make that well-defined uh, is, is up to grabs, but I'm going to take a Kantanoff sort of approach. I'm going to take, take, construct a non parenchyma invariant something, which is different from what we had before, but now at least it's well-defined. And we're going to do that by introducing explicit interaction and blocking and scaling. But the scaling is rather different from the other parameters here, uh, because we can define rescaling just to transform a particular mass uh, operator value distribution to something that has a different mass. And then we can modify the interaction parameters so that this expression is the same as this expression, is just written down in a different way in terms of many different uh, operator value distributions. And now that construction, we can use the Riesz-Leder theorem. We can apply the Riesz-Leder theorem, which just says that local operators acting on the vacuum vector V can approximate any vector. And in particular, a vector we want to approximate is the vector we constructed on the previous slide, which generates for us operated va uh, vacuum expectation values such as this. Because we can find a collection of local free field operators for which this expression, this vector, is very closely similar to this vector. And that is in the Hilbert space norm. And so that is enough to generate the vacuum expectation values the same as we get from Feynman by effectively overlapping many fragment resonances between many different fragments, each within F1 or F2 or F3 or F4, as it may be. So this is an inverse problem. We can find local nonlinear fragment functionals and free quantum fields that give the same results as our best path integrals. But having done that, we can do better than approximate what we can do with path integrals. We can hopefully approximate physics, too, perhaps even better than, uh, than path integrals. Who knows? With appropriate local free field operators, we can construct well-defined fragment resonance theories that are Poincaré invariant, too. This is nice, almost the holy grail, even. 
And having established we can do that, we'd like to carve nature at its joints if possible. So we want to write, we want to write, uh, decompose the Wigner characteristic function for a deformed uh, quantum field, something that is no longer just a Gaussian state. Uh, and we want to write that down in many different ways. Whatever works. Uh, and indeed, the alternative would be to just use much more elaborate mathematics because that might give us more insight as well. So I think an analysis of renormalization has suggested we should introduce nonlinearity. An analysis of path integrals shows that that is indeed enough. So what have we got with uh, weaker Weibman axioms is we've just introduced many measurement operators that are nonlinear in the test functions. And then we introduce a manifestly Poincaré invariant state, and that allows us to GNS construct a Hilbert space. Now, that it does not give us what a mathematician would like to have, which is a representation space of the Poincaré group. But if a mathematician wants that, they have a tool that they can use, direct or inductive limit, and that gives them the Fox space that they've been working with for a long time, or indeed deformation of that. Then as well, we have for quantum field theory, we want the spectrum conditional and microcausality, whereas for quantum non-diminishment field theory, we want universal measurement compatibility, and then we use whatever we, tools we want to, uh, to give us the non-commutative structure we need uh, to model experiments nicely. Now, non-linearity is unjustifiable as an axiomatic assumption, but the weakening of linearity to any non-linearity is, is arguably extreme. We can construct multipoint operator value distributions. Because if the f measurement is nonlinear in, in the test function, we can take functional derivatives and construct this as a two-point operator value distribution or any number of points, perhaps. Now, this is a structure that actually has been pursued before in the 1990s by uh, Wayne Polizu and his collaborators. Uh, and they use that kind of structure for bound states. And indeed, there's something more even that if an F measurement is not expressible as a functional Taylor series, which, if, for example, it would be if we just use a cutoff, so you're just using than of the test function, then test functions might wrap around the singular points of that, uh, of that structure, uh, the analytic structure, and that potentially will result in a discrete structure of a kind we have not previously used. Now, I'm not going to talk about constructions because of time, these three slides, um, but I will talk about these uh, constructions here, uh, with these concise list of the diffusions of quantum field theory, uh, where we have divergences are listed as the first from all the Frady and Ertinger in 2022. Uh, but I've suggested that nonlinear fragment resonance theory or some other mathematics can give us uh, a way around the divergences we're used to from path integral formulations and the like. There's no precise ontological picture, we, we would usually say, but I suggest signal analysis gives us a way of thinking about that, together with a classical approach to measurement and compatibility. There are no particles is a frequent worry, uh, and yet by introducing weaker Whiteman axioms, that means there will be more models, and in particular we've introduced nonlinearity. We now have nonlinearity and dispersion, which is enough in classical mechanics to allow us to construct solitons and caustics, and hopefully that will be the case for this mathematics too. Hogg's theorem is much more technical, but again, nonlinearity allows us to construct subalgebras, which will get us around Hogg's theorem. And then finally, we have the measurement problem, where I suggest we can solve that, or at least rethink it, by, uh, in terms of collapse as a joint probability construction. So I don't, won't talk about quantum gravity. Uh, and so we come to the final slide, uh, where we have uh, that we really want to think about this, about experiment, I suggest, in something like a Copenhagen sort of way, but also in a way that is very, very reminiscent of machine learning as we're applying it now. We take actually recorded measurement results, we analyze it in a machine learning or other data analysis way, and then we want to predict what the future data will be. And so we're talking about statistics and expected statistics in many different experimental contexts. Because we're taking the data to be classical in the first instance, a QND model is always possible. But a QFT model is often preferable because it's positive frequency that gives us an analytic form of quantum non-diminution field theory, and so that it can be mathematically very preferable. We also have I've argued that signal analysis and reanalysis of realization suggests nonlinearity, and that that's enough. Finally, I point out that 
Koopman's Hilbert space formalism for classical mechanics. <coughs> Once we've added in non-commutativity and quantum noise, that gives us two types of description that are equally powerful. And so there's no such thing as non-classicality if we allow CM+. Plus. Nor is there such a thing as a classical system and a quantum system as two separate things. We've unified them. Quantum and classical, classical plus, are just types of description. Doesn't change how we think how things look. Quantum and classical in the literature, I suggest, have been converging uh, in many ways for decades. And there I will finish. Thank you.